yes, do gonna, this. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you here, Gail. Is that okay? <laughs> For those who don't know this speaker, this is Gail Eckrich. Uh, he came to Texas by way of Germany. He was born there, and he, after he graduated from college, he joined the U.S. Army and infantry, and then went all the way around the globe and retired in Central Texas. He has taught uh, some state and government, uh, federal government courses at Central Texas College, and we um, retired from that in August of 2009. And he was the wildlife biologist in Fort Hood's Natural Resources Management Branch for 22 years. He's also been active in Twin Lakes Audubon Society for over 20 years, and I hope we get back to, to meeting again, hopefully. Indeed. And he is a great nature photographer, and um, he concentrates on birds, and he's always looking for a great shot. So here is Gil. Thank you, Gil, for coming. My pleasure, and I hope we do the next one instead of virtually that we do it on the ground. Are we ready? Yes, sir. You go go for it. All right, here we go. Normally, if it's not a pandemic, we do a birding field trip to Fort Hood. This one I'm going to try and do virtually going to the same places that we would be going to if we were out on Fort Hood, but just doing it virtually. And you'll probably actually get to see more birds this way, but I am doing it as if it were in the middle of May. So around 15 May is when all of these birds and locations would be the ones that you could reasonably expect. So now let's get started. We normally meet there on North Nolan Road and I've got an arrow pointing to the location. There's a parking area there and that's where we always link up. Once we have everybody there, and sometimes even before everybody gets there, we start birding. And one of the first things we'll see right there in the parking lot is a bluebird. Now that is one of the old posts out there and you see the bluebird with a grasshopper. Now this bluebird is important because somebody had asked me to mention about the February storm. And I'm going to get started with that now. People were posting photos in different social media of bluebirds dead. I mean, several of them dead in one bluebird nesting box. And there was so much dismay, understandably so, of course, of how this could happen. Let's look at that for a minute. Here's a bluebird going into approaching one of the nesting boxes. And if you look carefully at the opening of the box, you see a youngster with its mouth wide open, feed me now. But that box is important. I want you to look at it. It's a very well-made box, but it is not the same as this. Here's an ash-throated flycatcher approaching a nest cavity in a telephone pole, or just imagine that it is a tree stump. What's different between this and what I showed you in the nesting box? It is totally, entirely insulated. There are no drainage holes. There are no little ventilation holes or cavities, no flaps. It is strictly one hole, the rest is wood, which serves as an insulator. So all of those bluebirds that were relying on the bluebird nesting boxes, if this were any normal season, would have been perfectly good, would have produced perfectly great broods. But this February was different as all of you can recall. And that is one reason why we had so many casualties among the Eastern bluebirds that were nesting in cavities. So we do have less of the Eastern bluebirds around this year, 
they will recover. They can nest up to four broods per year. And I assure you, hang on, Joe, I'll let you post that again. I didn't quite read what you put on. Post it up again, would you please, Joe? And I just saw somebody posting about you're not seeing the bluebirds this year. Well, now you're seeing one reason why. As I mentioned, they will recover because those that did survive will have multiple broods. Also, the wintering eastern bluebirds that come from up north down here will notice there is a vacancy. Some, not all, but some will stay and replenish our local supply. Nature at work, Master Naturalist. And here's the ash throated flycatcher going to one of the bluebird boxes. They don't ask for identification. It is simply <laughs> a nesting cavity. Something else, I'm going to go backwards that you notice here and here, there are no little sticks, no little branches right below the box for birds to perch on. Nature does not provide that. Another bird that is here year round, but in low numbers in the winter, but it definitely picks up. Ah, I noticed a remark about the titmice. Titmice are cavity nesters, as are the Carolina chickadees. And I just saw a question about modifying the nest boxes. Folks, this February was abnormal under any circumstance that we could apply to it. In any normal, whatever that might be, year, those nest boxes that you all have put up, that you've even built yourself, will be, are perfectly good. This was strictly an aberration. God, I hope so anyway. But the lark sparrow is one that we can see from the parking lot where we gather. And here's one that just got a bug. And they will nest on the ground. They will nest up in the trees up to about 10 feet elevation. But most of the time, they're on the ground like this one. Take a look at this lark sparrow nest. I hope you can see my pointer. There's the female on the nest. Perfectly well concealed that unless you see the bird flying in to the nest, correct, under the nettle, absolutely correct. That provides the shade that the bird does require, but it's perfectly concealed. We have probably more birds here nesting on the ground than what people imagine birds nesting way up in the trees. And the most common place for the nest is at medium height, about waist to maybe chest high in that range. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as I go along. Here's one that nests at chest high and we'll hear them more than see them right there in the parking lot, the white eyed vireo, well, the name is obvious. It's the only one that has an entire white eye ring. So identification is easy. And this is one of those birds, and we'll show you, and I'll show you another one, that you hear, I guarantee you'll hear it. <laughs> you might not see it too much. This is the other vireo. That's the usual view. If you get to see it like this on one of our field trips, be happy. You've done well to see it. This bird is skittish, flighty, moving constantly. But of course, one time while I was leading a field trip for some folks from New England, 
I'm giving him this spiel. Oh, you might get lucky to see him. Well, a lady points up into a bare branch of a dead tree and goes, is that one of them up there? Yes, it was. But usually they're hidden like this. Now, let me show you a little bit more about this bird. This is the view that I wish I could provide when I lead young field trips. It's a movie. Please watch. There's a male coming in to feed. Kids are begging. One adult passes, the male passes food to the female, and she feeds the nestling. These nestlings, by the way, fledged, that means left the nest the very next morning. It was a successful nesting endeavor. And that's quite important because the vireo had been an endangered species. I was listed in 1987. As this graphic shows, back in 1987, Fort Hood had, as far as we knew, 85 pairs. That is it. Now look how many we have on the installation. Over 8,000 black cap vireo pairs. And that is why they have been delisted as of a couple of years ago. Three years ago, they were delisted in 2018. So this is one of those success stories that we wish we had so many more of. Another bird we could see from the parking area while we wait for everybody to get there is this guy, the blue-gray gnat catcher. It is one of the ones that comes here primarily during the breeding season, although a few, I stress a few, stay here during the winter, on mild winters. This is a male. How do I know it's a male? This dark area over the eyebrow, the eyebrow itself, means it's a male. The female does not have the dark area over there. This is one of our very active nesting species and was also, had also been affected by the cowbirds, which I'll be talking about. Now we're going to drive from here down to this wide open grass area where right now, by the way, there are, I'd say, about 50 military vehicles bivacking here. And that's what Ford was there for, and I want to stress that. Yeah, it's prairie. A lot of birds are in there. The units are in their training right now. Most of the ground nesters are gone. Joe, could you put it up again? I didn't see what you had there. <laughs> yeah, that road. All right, we move into this grassland. And on the grassland, we have, singing his heart out, the grasshopper sparrow. Very nondescript bird, and when he's down in the grass and they nest on the ground, the bird becomes invisible. But when the male is advertising, like this guy is, he'll find the most prominent visible perch, and like so many other male avian species, it's hello, ladies. And that is how they get. Anybody that comes in the area, if it's a female, please come by. If it's another male, stay away. We also have the Western Kingbird. 
that you'll see in that area. And then this is also male. These are only here during the summer. They migrate up from Mexico and breed here. If you see a bird in the winter that looks very much like this one, it could very well be one of the rare, but lately more common actually, couches kingbirds that come up from Mexico, from South Texas, and come here. That's right, Zoe, you have them, and we have a couch's kingbird nesting in one of the small um, shopping areas in Belt, nesting right there in an oak tree. This is a western kingbird nest. And notice the size of the youngster being fed by the adult. Same size as the adult. This is one of the species that when they fledge, they actually fly out of the nest. Many species, when they fledge, the birds do not have fully developed plumage and all the youngsters can do is hop, literally hop out of the nest hop around on the ground, the adults will be in the area calling to them, get over here, get over here now, I'm telling you, I want you to get over here. And you can actually hear the frantic <laughs> noises that the adults make to get the young to come. For those of you that have been here long enough, you know that you will find people, well-meaning people that will see these youngsters hopping around on the ground. And the first instinct is, oh, the baby fell out of the nest and they'll pick it up and they'll find somebody who can feed it or do something for it. Well, birds do occasionally fall out of the ground. It's true. But in the overwhelming majority of the occasions, there is an adult in the area waiting for you to leave the youngster alone so that they can call it over and take it to a safe place. So if you have these little guys hopping around, please restrain yourself, your dog, your cat always, and just observe them. And you might be surprised of what you might see as the adults come to try and shepherd and lure the youngsters away. It's one of the great experiences that you can have. Another flycatcher that you'll see down there, and we all love it, don't we? Scissor tail flycatcher. That's a nice male. How do I know it's a male? That is a very long tail and a lot of orange, reddish coloration to the abdomen and on the shoulder of the wing. So this is a male. Here's a nest. And I'm gonna play a quick video of the young being fed. Notice it's a very windy day. Having shown you that, nest sanitation. What do birds do? Some, like the barn swallows, that like the nest on your fan that you have over your porch or under your porch cover. You know, they just poop. But I want you to watch this. This is what more birds actually do. Here's a youngster. Notice it's elevated a tiny. Here we go. And notice how the adult is intensely watching the progress of the youngster pooping. The poop is now being expanded. It's called properly a fecal sac. That's the proper term. Pulling some of it out. 
Yes, birds are incredibly <laughs> devoted. There is the fecal sac. The adult has it. And notice as the adult is flying away, the little one still is extended, but there's the fecal sac, which the adult is removing to keep the nest clean and remove anything that has a scent to it, which reduces the chance of predation for that nest. Now, this is one of my favorite nests of all time. And I want you to look. Yep, they sure do. Notice this little one. You notice the fuzzy feathers? If you look at young nestlings, here we go, even around the tail, they've got these fuzzy feathers. Well, this particular nest I'm watching, the adults are away gathering food, and it's exactly on this very same day, but I'm just watching. I'm not even operating my camera. And here comes this little gal. This is a hybrid tip mouse. And look what this little gal has in her bill. You see that fuzzy furry? It's not furry, of course. It's fuzzy feathers. It flew up to the flycatcher nest, flew up to the nestlings, and started plucking the down recycling, I guess so. Recycling. <laughs> The fuzz. One of the adults came flying back and goes, what the tarnation are you doing to my kids? And chased the titmouse away. The titmouse flew a short distance away. And by then I had my camera up and operating. And that's what, why did the titmouse do it? That is perfect nest insulation. Which brings me to another point. If you have a shaggy dog, that you should be brushing periodically. Why not brush it and collect the fur in some sort of a container with a lot of openings to it, like those little cages that they have for suet uh, bricks, and hang it out there or put it on a post or something for these little cavity nesters especially there you go, start saving it. Now, those of you that want to do this, if you bathe your dog with any of the chemicals that let them smell good for three months and kill all of the bugs, please, Master Naturalist, do not use that fur to leave out for the birds. It is chemically treated and can be hazardous. So if you just use regular soap to wash or you don't wash your furry friend, that's what you should put out. But this is a nice example of how nature operates. Oh, Guy Fowler, I'm not even going there. Another bird you'll see down there, one of our beautiful summer breeding species is the blue grosbeak and the name reflects the german word for big gross yes it's a very big billed beaked bird it's a beautiful bird that we have here and it nests at about waist high or even lower in shrubs it is not a tree nester Dick Sissel, I know you've heard him. They'll come in, and when they're passing through, we had one field where we had some very other unusual birds in East Bell County earlier this year. I counted in one field at least 50 Dick Sissels moving about and the male singing. They were all not there to nest. Some did, of course but most of them were passing through to other destinations. But it's one of the very beautiful and easily seen at this time of the year species that we have. And grasslands with sparse, low woods, little shrubs, that, as you can see in this photo, is what they like. 
Now we're going to move on. We're going to look at some mixed vegetation. We're leaving this grass area. I'm following this road, which becomes a trail further on down, going all the way down. So let's start by moving on down to this area. This is Brookhaven Mountain. And right there, we have this guy. If we have a field trip in May, I can still show a golden cheek warbler to you. But chances are it won't be sitting at the top of an ash juniper singing his little heart out as they do when they arrive in March. Now, Texans, of course, call this vegetation cedar. It is not a cedar. It is ash juniper. The other thing I always stress is some of the mythology that was spread, has been spread, about this bird and its habitat. What are some of the mythologies? This tree is, yes, it is. It's the ash juniper, not cedar. That this juniper is not native to Texas. Well, we have fossil records from Ice Age that they were here. The other question I always love to ask people who bring up this so-called point is if it is brought in an introduced species, where did it come from? It is found nowhere else but in the hill country, the limestone of Texas. And this bird is the only bird that only breeds in Texas. Got a question to ask. What's our state bird? Somebody posted or talk. What's the state bird? Ah, I see mocking, mocking. Well, let's be precise. Ah, thank you. It is the northern mockingbird. Now think about it. The northern mockingbird is the state bird of Texas, as well as five states. Why shouldn't we have a unique Texas-only state bird, the golden cheek warbler? Wouldn't that make sense? Just tossing that out. The other, one of my favorite mythologies is that when it was listed, people, some people were very upset about it. One of the rumors was that the black federal helicopters were flying low here in central Texas, which you see all the time, but they were dropping juniper seeds so they could take over private lands. Oh, don't get me going about the black vulture, Zoe, please. <laughs> I'll show you one here in a minute. Here's a Carolina wren, one of our standard birds. This is the one that if you have a bird nesting in your garage, your carport, on your deck, in the seat that you left out, anything like that, this is probably this one. And you see this particular one gathering nesting material. And if there's any bird that sings in the wintertime, this is the most likely bird. It's a year-around Texas resident. The other year-round resident is the Buick's wren. It's another cavity nester. And I showed you those nest boxes, and I showed you the opening in the power pole. Those are preferred nesting areas. They are cavity nesters. And this winter, from what I noticed around my place, they did quite well. Where we're going, there's some shrubs next to the road, or small trees, namely flame leaf sumac. That is the preferred nesting substrate of one of our other nesting vireos. And this is the Bell's Vireo, and you see it's built like all of the other Vireo nests, suspended from a fork of a tree at about waist level. And there's the adult, and I can't tell if that's male or female from there, feeding the young. 
they also fledged the very next day. They are expanding their range here in Central Texas. Trees that have died for power poles will often be used by woodpeckers. You all know that's where the woodpecker holds. Now, somebody else on Saturday, I gave a presentation, asked me about the holds in power poles. I'm talking about wooden ones. You notice that the woodpecker holes are always right at the very tip top. And someone said, well, how about that treated wood? Well, those poles that utility companies use are treated, of course. But over the years, the chemicals leach downward out. And as they leach down, the very tip top of the power pole becomes nothing but untreated wood, and that is where the woodpeckers then build their cavity nests. So it all makes sense. This particular downy woodpecker likes the areas close to the lake and willows, and willows are logical because they have a very short lifespan and their wood is very soft, making them ideal for nest cavity birds. Correct, there's a bunch on Lake Belt, and that's the key. And this one is right down by the lake, down Fort Hood. There's a migrant. I could show you, if I wanted to show you migrants, beautiful warblers that migrate through here, 26 species. So why am I not showing you? Because by mid-May, most of them have passed through here, but there are a few migrating birds that are still passing through here on 15 May. And this willow flycatcher is one of them. They do not nest here. They nest quite a ways north of here, all the way up into Michigan and so forth. And the name shows you exactly why they nest there. Willows. And why? Bugs. If you go down to a lake, especially where there are willow trees, I guarantee Bugs, and that's what they need. Oh, too fast. Now, somebody mentioned the yellow breast of chat earlier. Remember that? Well, they come here to nest, and they're invariably close to water. Invariably. And that is one of the nesting species, and they also pass through here. This yellow breast of chat used to be lumped with the warblers. But if you look at the size of that bill, the size of the bird, it was finally decided, no, it's not a warbler. And they are now unique by themselves as a yellow-breasted chat, one of our beautiful birds that nests here. And also, again, down close to the willows. yellow bill cuckoo. It's got food here. Yes, the call, I don't know if you're talking about the cuckoo there or the chat. They both have very unique, and even somebody as deaf as I am can hear them. Ah, the cuckoo. Now, guy just knows, yes, the cuckoo and the sound. Who knows what the local colloquial name for the yellow-billed cuckoo has been forever? Somebody post it. Let's see it. There's a question mark. Come on, somebody knows this. Oh, it's killing me. The rain crow. People thought that it was a crow when they heard it. And because of the vocalization at certain times of the day and under certain atmospheric conditions, they felt a predicted a rain occurrence. So I guess yesterday evening would have been a good time for them to call, but there's only one issue. They have pretty well progressed with their nesting or even finished in some cases. So therefore, you have less vocalization at this time than you would in mid-May when they're at the peak of their breeding. Next stop, south shore of 
Felton Lake. There's the lake. This is a very large, very flat area that right now is inundated. And when I drew this graphic and I drew this very precise circle, I did not realize until I went there yesterday to look around, this pretty well shows where the lake, because of the flooding that had occurred, went all the way up to. But that flooding always rejuvenates that part of the lake and provides us with some interesting birds as late as mid-May. Here we go. Look at this beautiful bird. It's quite a large bird. It's the Hudsonian Godwit. The nickname is the Hudwit. And most of the ones that you see will not be this brightly colored. But this one was, yes, it is beautiful. This one was actually photographed like most of the photos that I'm showing you. Either on 15 May, like this one, or within a few days of either side of it. This one was photographed on 15 May, and you see it's a flooded area that it's feeding in. They do not nest here. They strictly pass through here on migration. Long-billed Dowager, same thing. Now, these will also be occasionally seen here. Joe pointed out that the field trip is part of the class. Yes. And if there's any way I can do it for this coming year, and I hope we will do it, I hope to host you on Fort Hood for a field trip such as this. Guy wants to go, and I want to take you, folks. I really do. But we see this long-billed dowager at times during the winter. But then they're just basically plain white and gray. You notice how beautiful the coloration is when they're in full breeding, or the proper term is alternate plumage that they are now. The spotted sandpiper. Still a couple of them in mid-May passing through. You can see why it's called that. Now, if you see the spotted sandpiper in the winter, and you see a few of them here in the winter, and I've seen them down in South America quite often in many places. It's the same bird minus any of these spots. Beautiful bird. Petrel sandpiper still passing through at this time for a couple more days. Snowy egret. You will rarely see them here in the winter, but they're quite common right now. I saw one tree yesterday that had eight of them in it. And you'll notice what this one, this photo was taken right there on that flat when it was inundated. And there it's got one of the little, and I don't know if it's a minnow, which means a small carp technically, or if it's a young of some species, but it did get a fish, and that's what they make a living on. The nickname is Golden Slippers. Voila! You now see why it's called golden slippers. And that's the snowy egret. One of your members brought something to my attention which I really should have noticed myself. But Lynn Fleming is the one who drew my attention to it. And I now go back to one of my opening comments about the tragic February freeze. She pointed out, Gil, have you seen any killdeer? She says, I'm not seeing any. I'm used to seeing them. Where are they? Well, I found this one right down there in that flat, middle of May, and I found this one. I should have seen a dozen to two dozen of them in the big open area because it is a ground related bird that feeds on the ground that freeze literally froze it to the ground and we don't see him this year i was ecstatic when i saw this female and what you see her doing there is trying to lead me away she's doing the pro 
broken wing display. So her left wing, she's flopping up and down, and she's kind of hopping on the ground because she had a nest nearby. They will come back. I've seen a couple of successful broods, and it's another case where wintering birds that come here from up north, I do believe, firmly believe, that there will be some, I don't know how many, I hope it's lots, that will go, oh, look, great habitat, lots of food, look at all these vacancies, let's stay here. I think that will happen. To what degree? Speculation. I have no idea how to actually quantify that. Somebody mentioned a black vulture, and you can tell what it's eaten there. That's a raccoon. They are nature's, as well as the turkey vulture, they are nature's cleanup crew. Should be treated accordingly. They are here. I've seen them in South America. They are residents. We get some from up north that spend the winter here. So if you drive along either Belt or Stillhouse Dam and look over the dam along the green area, that's where you'll see them. That's where they like to roost and then take off as the air currents hit the dam and provide nice uplift. Then they'll go scouting for food. Very useful. And there's the turkey vulture. You notice how nature created a beautiful bird. You go, what do you mean beautiful? Nature doesn't look at beauty the way we, we do. Ah, Zoe just posted about uh, killed their nest in a parking lot. Folks, in a parking lot, especially of gravel with asphalt, look around for certain birds. Yes, a killdeer will nest there, but another one for this time of year. I wish I had, I don't think I have a photo on this presentation, but I know you've seen it. And that's the bull bat. That's the Texas term for the common night hawk. They will nest in such parking lots. If you see that, and there's still some in nesting mode right now, the traffic cones, barriers, whatever else, just put them up around it. People can use the parking lot every other way, but that area where that nest is, where that bird is, go ahead and block it off. You don't need to do anything else. It'll do fine. But that is a natural occurrence, just using a semi-natural setting. The common grackle. It's different from the one that you see around Walmart and Scott and White, etc. The tail is not as long. This is how long the gray tail grackle tail would be. And notice the beautiful color of the common grackle. Look at those variances of color. Zoe just mentioned about in Africa, they have some amazing vultures there. And one of them, the one that's an Egyptian vulture, is very much in danger because somebody decided that it had some ingredients that would be useful for treating some diseases. We do know such lunacy exists in other countries. So I'll leave it at that. Now, this common grackle nowadays is anything but common. We see the great tail grackle as being the common grackle, but the common one is the great tail, not the common grackle. Oh, they will feed on the deer carcass in a hurry. Any carcass, trust me. Another one of our wintering birds I know you've seen them. That is the small heron that we have. Here within a few days, we start seeing the youngsters. How do you know it's a youngster? Instead of having this lovely maroonish, reddish, solid, almost colored breast down to the abdomen, it'll be whitish with these reddish, brownish stripes on it. 
those are the young birds. They nest fairly high up in a tree, are here in the summer, and in our area of Texas are gone for the winter. We have had, to the best of my recollection, two accurate, believable sightings during the winter. That's it. Here's one of our beautiful nesting birds down by the water, usually. That's the indigo bunting. The name is obvious. It is indigo. It is only here during the breeding season. And they also nest at about waist high. That's it. Another migrant. This is one of the later flycatcher ones that we see. And it's reliably seen, oh, by the way, in the first 10 to 12 days in September when they're doing the reverse migration. And that's the olive-sided flycatcher. What makes this guy pretty unique and easy to spot is that fairly prominent crest, which other flycatchers have to? A fairly broad bill, which other flycatchers have to? But more than any other flycatcher, it has a very pronounced vest. And during migration, this is the very tip top of a dead tree. I cannot stress enough the vital importance of dead trees to so many avian species and so many other critters. So if you're a landowner and you have a tree that's dying, if it's close to your house, yeah, do something about it, of course. But if you can't afford to do so by either city ordinance or whatever else, or it's your property out in the countryside, try leaving some dead trees up. You might be pleasantly surprised. Dalton again from Fort Hood. Neotropic cormorant. I know you all have seen trees here at various times of the year with cormorants sitting on them. So why am I presumptuous enough from this distance to say it's a neotropic? Well, let me show you. Here are both cormorants that come here at varying times of the year. In the winter, we see sizable flocks of the double crested cormorant. Notice the yellow above the bill right in front of the eye. The neotropic does not have that prominent yellow coloration and the tail is shorter than this one and the time of the year. The double crested is a wintering species. By mid-May, they are pretty much, if not all, gone up north. The Neotropic, we have some that are actually here in the winter nowadays. They've moved north in the wintertime, but it's only a few. But as this image shows, at this time of the year, voila, we have quite a few of those cormorants. And those are at this time of the year, and we're talking about 15 August. And right now, by the way, June is going to be the Neotropic Cormorant. Another bird that you'll only see during migration, and it's a very late migrant versus all the other gulls or terns that we see, is the black tern. Well, it's called the black tern. And you'll only see it mid-March to starting about 10 August on return migration. Now, I said starting because it's not a short period. Many of our migrating birds that pass through here are on a clock when they're heading north. They have to get there in a perfect time window for when the vegetation 
is at its peak, producing the peak insect levels, especially caterpillars that are needed for reproduction, for food. They have to get there. They've got a very narrow time frame. The return, well, they can take their time. I've seen some briefings on some of the warblers that pass through here in the spring. You might see some of them here, such as the black Bernian warbler. Probably for about five days in May, five to 10, maybe 15 May, some every now and then, you might see a black Bernian warbler. That's it, and they're headed up north. I mean, way up north. But if somebody up there does a transmitter study, that means they put up a mist net, net one of these birds and put a radio transmitter in a little harness on the back here, then that bird will record on that it's actually a receiver, not a transmitter, of where it has been. So when somebody sees it in Colombia, nets it, or upon its return to Minnesota, nets it again, takes off that little transmitter receiver, sends it in, has to be sent to England, by the way, there are only the ones that can interpret it. And you can then see where it's been. Well, these birds will then fly Louisiana, Florida, visit Cuba, maybe the Yucatan Peninsula, maybe Chiapas province of Mexico. They may drop by Nicaragua. They may go by Costa Rica. And eventually they may even show that they're at the wintering range in Colombia. In other words, there's no hurry to get there. They've done their breeding cycle. Who would like to visit now? One of my favorite swallows that we have here for mid-May is the northern rough-winged swallow. And here we have, this is one of my favorite images. Here's an adult. You notice the bill is all dark, black. Young birds, as you saw in the other footages that I've shown you, the videos and also photos, the young have yellow lining the bill. Why? It's a target. You saw that as the adult approaches, the youngsters open their mouths, gaping, feed me! Well, this adult came in, the youngster had its mouth wide open, put this insect in it, and the little one goes, okay, now what am I supposed to do? Following images, there'd be too many for me to post. The adult took the insect out again, crunched it a little bit, and then stuck it back in. So the youngster was fed successfully. Yeah, you saw correctly. <laughs> oh, what do you mean by what? You want the insect? That is probably one of the flies that looks like a wasp. I don't think it might be one of the wasps. Yeah, I think it is a wasp. Hadleygrit. You don't see many of them during the winter. April, everywhere out in the fields. Right now you still see some, but not as many. This is an interesting species. We have some birds here in Central Texas that are called invasive species. That means they're birds that were originally in other parts of the world, but some misguided individual decided, oh, we need them in the United States of America, and they imported the house sparrow, the pigeon, the rock pigeon I'm talking about, and they also imported the Eurasian, I'm drawing a blank, that, 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 I'll come into it in a second. Well, those three species have become nuisance species. The starling, thank you, Sarah. The Eurasian starling. 
and the starling is very insidious. They will even go up to the nest cavity, believe it or not, of an eastern screech owl, drive out the owl, and take over the nest. Now, the cattle egret is from Africa, but no misguided individual brought it over. If you look at a globe, parts of South America are not that far from the cattle egrets native range in Africa. So if you get the right atmospheric conditions and you get a pressure front moving from the coast of Africa over to the coast of South America and you're a bird that's riding the current, the air currents, voila, the cattle egret arrived in South America and hasn't looked back. And with that, if I'm approved to do so, I suggest we regroup, uh, disperse and regroup at 11.10. So anybody that needs a break, I would suggest this is a superb time to go on a break. See you all in a little bit. That'd be great, Gil. In the meantime, I can tell my rattlesnake story that just happened. <laughs> okay, so my wife came in. And she was going, there's a rattlesnake, there's a rattlesnake. She had left to go to Salado earlier and there was a little rabbit in the driveway and it wasn't dead, but it appeared injured and wasn't moving. When she came back, there was a big rattlesnake in my driveway with a great big bulge in its stomach. I'm thinking the rattlesnake had bitten the rabbit and my wife walked up to the rabbit. I'm glad she didn't get bitten by a rattlesnake. But uh, so when she came back, there's this big rattlesnake in the driveway. I hate rattlesnakes. I'm sorry, guy. But I took a big hoe and I chopped the rattlesnake's head off. So there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Wow. Anyway, my heart's beating real fast because I just had an encounter with a rattlesnake. I'm with the rattlesnake. It's nature in action. I know, but it was in my driveway, Gil. I mean, right by my house. Uh, I've I'm had sorry. it down in my pond, interesting, at one of my ponds, interestingly enough, two years in a row, the same day of the year, one day apart, in the same exact location. And that's the only time I've seen the rattler there. All right. Go figure. Go figure. But I've encountered quite a few rattlers, and one of my favorite bird stories is about people like to ascribe human characteristics, anthropomorphism. <laughs> I don't believe in that, but here are two observations of the same species. And you're talking about the rattlesnake. When I was trapping cowbirds, and our cowbird traps, the cages, the boxes, had chicken wire back then. Well, snakes would get through the wire, eat a cowbird, and sometimes up to seven cowbirds, try and exit through the chicken wire. But once they've eaten a cowbird, the tummy is too fat and they ain't going. Another bird, and I don't many of you know it, that's also more down by the water than anywhere else and for another obvious reason this is another willow tree it is soft short life expectancy makes a perfect area for the red-bellied woodpecker to take as a nesting cavity that's what this particular one is doing and you see the tongue right there that tongue can be extended. Look how far I'm putting the pointer, all the way out to here. And that's why I've had one little woodpecker, it's a downy that I've got at the house. He likes my hummingbird feeders. And while hummingbirds use their tongues to reach down in there, so can the woodpecker and my little guy's got a sweet tooth. But this is one of our native ones. 
Oh yeah, they'll come to bird feed. Those of you, I just saw they know about bird feeder. It's especially in the winter time. Those that have suet in it and a mixture of uh, dried insects, maybe grub worms or whatever, plus some seeds, that makes very high quality food for so many species. And these woodpeckers will take advantage. The American crow. All of you have seen it. There weren't many around, but they've started picking up again. It is one of our natives. It's large and it's quite often confused. And I see reports of a raven. Well, I'm going to have to be more careful in my judgment of people calling a crow a raven because we now have in central Texas in Bell County a nesting pair of common raven. First one that we know of. The raven is much larger than the crow. The raven is larger, believe it or not, than a red-tailed hawk. That's big. And the bill, while this crow has obviously a substantial bill, taint nothing in comparison to the size, the thickness, and length of the raven bill. But we do have these, they're quite common. And they get used to people. You go to a place like Temple Lake Park, where the boat ramp is, they're not going to be too skittish. They're not going to be worried about you too much. Or at the Belt Lake Outdoor Recreation Area on Fort Hood. Here's one. Down by the water quite often. But also quite often with the vultures that I showed you earlier. These are juvenile. Cresta Cara Cara. How do I know juvenile? Because they're... <laughs> We're in toupees, yeah, a very bad toupee. But these are juvies because they're brown and white. Bigger ravens, you know, that's actually a good term, Joe. And most of the time, they're actually more associated with the vultures because although they're actually technically a falcon, they do like carcasses and will actually compete with the vultures for the carcasses. Now I know some of you, such as Joe, have been here forever. Those of you who have been here forever, ah, and Guy Fowler just made a comment that I was going, where I was alluding to. Back in the beginning of the 90s, there were no Cresta Caracara in the area. What's happened? They've moved in. They've expanded and they are now a common nester in Central Texas as probably, if not most of you, if not all of you, most of you can relate to that they have really picked up in their population here in Central Texas without anybody introducing it. But these are two juveniles that are down in that flat. This guy's freaking amazing. He's oh, awesome. 21. Now oh. we're going to move again. This is the flat where we were at. And we're going to move a pretty good ways. This is one of the guys. Amazing. It's actually named. He's so great next year because y'all get to go out. I'll go with you though. Hey, guy. Guy. Whoa. Mute yourself. Sorry. I'm sitting here. I, my wife came in and gave me a snack. And I'm sitting here talking about how much how I'm enjoying this class. Sorry. Hey, if you share the vocalization, you share the snack. If you can't share the snack, that's it. Okay. All right. I'll bring snacks to the next meeting. Bring it on the field trip. All right. Moving on this road here. And it's you notice it's a named road. So you're on Fort Hood. That means you can legally drive on this road without having a Ford Hood area access permit. I'm telling you this because the moment 
you pull off the road, stop, and even walk a short distance into the adjacent areas, you are technically on a Fort Hood range. You do not enter a Fort Hood range without a valid Fort Hood area access pass, going through proper procedures, or you're on a field trip with me. But please do not. Now, the one place you can go to without any restrictions as a pure civilian, I'm going to show you on the map, is right here is a huge sign, and back here to Fort Hood, Belton Lake Outdoor Recreation Area. You have to pay to get in. I think it's 10 bucks for a civilian now. But then you have full access to this entire area. Yes, Blora, as it's called. And there are nesting golden cheek warblers. We have some black capped vireos and many other good birds and nature to be seen. Very good, Chris that you can see right here on the Belton Lake Outdoor Recreation Area. So, just a suggestion. Anyway, moving on. As we're driving, I'm going, oh, see Daisy. One of the areas we're going to drive down to the lake very briefly is we're going to turn there and go down to the lake to get to that tree. Those are tree swallows, two males. If you look at just about any publication, digital or in print, of the range, the breeding range of the tree swallow, it does not show Central Texas. Well, I'm very sorry, but they do nest on both of our lakes in dead trees that are out either in the water, preferably, or at the very edge of the water. But that's what a tree swallow nests. And they do nest here in central Texas. Beautiful bird. Another one that you can see, and again, because of the trees that have nest cavities, this is a beautiful rufous morph eastern screech owl. Relatively common bird in central Texas. It's our smallest owl. The most common one, they do use nest boxes. If you do use a nest box, please clean them periodically, replace whatever's in there. This is an interesting species. They will actually take the little blind snake, a few inches long, pick it up, not to eat it, but to carry it to their nest cavity and drop it in there because it will eat little insects that might get in there that could be harmful to either the young or recent or about to fledge screech owls. Yes, that nature. Well, all, that's all I can say is nature. Now, this is a beautiful little bird. Most of ours, by the way, folks, if you see one, won't be this color. It'll be that color right there. And notice what I'm pointing out. If it's that color and if it's sitting up next to a gray bark, that bird with its modeling and colors becomes invisible. That's why in our part of Texas, this is the unusual color. Most of them are modeled gray. Here is Beep Beep, one of our standard birds. No, they don't go Beep Beep, but they do have a very pronounced vocalization and they do love anything they can catch be it a lizard as this one be it a snake be it a little mammal be it a bird they're very efficient predators and i've had them nesting from knee height in a shrub to up in a tree at about 10 foot elevation so it's another one of those flexible nesters that we have here in Central Texas. But it is in, pardon, it may one of the birds we could reasonably expect, expect to see. Hang on, I'm gonna take a quick coffee drink. I'm hiccuping. Last year, a friend of mine, an old army buddy, Calls me and said, Gil, I've got this bird here, and according to what I'm looking at, 
it's a Harris's hawk. And I go, no, nah, ain't no way, dude. And he goes, I'll send you a picture. Well, my good friend Wally was right. The first record of a Harris's hawk, and it was a pair of them in Bell County. Wally Montgomery is the one who spotted it and told us about it. Those of you that have been in South Texas, like one of y'all has recently been down with her new lens, did you see these by any chance? If you drive along any utility pole or dead tree down in South Texas, there is a reasonable chance you will see this dark colored, fairly good sized hawk in South Texas. Yes, Randy Pinkston is still active. The Davis Mountains, very similar habitat. Yes. I know, oh, Juan, while you were there, you met a friend of mine down there. He's quite active as a photographer. You met Tim. And here's the American Crow and the Red-Tailed Hawk, which is, for most people, our most common hawk. It's here year-round, plus we have wintering ones that come here. Yes, Tim is a great guy. Notice the size of the crow is smaller than the hawk. Now think about what I mentioned earlier. The raven is larger than this fairly large hawk. The only hawk we get through here, and I've only seen him here three times in Bell County, is the ferruginous hawk. That's the only one that's going to be larger around here. But most of the times you're not even going to think about seeing a ferrugi here. Another one of the birds, I know you've seen this, especially those of you with the fans outdoors or swimming pool area, any other place like that, the barn swallow. And they do build that nest and they, it's an open nest up in the corner usually. And they are quite beautiful as you can tell from this image. But they do leave a mess outside of their nest because the young don't expel a fecal sac like the others. It's basically put your hiney over the edge and bombs away. One of our beautiful nest cavity birds, probably the easiest place for any of you ladies and gentlemen to go see it is Temple Lions Park. A couple of nesting pairs there. It's the great crested flycatcher. It's a beautiful colored flycatcher, and you notice how prominent the crest is. It is also, oh, by the way, a cavity nester. And that's why it's around Lions Park. Sorry, Gil. I just I just muted you. I was going through looking. Uh, unmute yourself and continue. My apologies. Boy, that's about as subtle as a <laughs> man. Oh, <laughs> do you have me back now? Yes, yes, we do. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Boy, that's a technique I'm going to have to remember. <laughs> Anyhow, it is also a cavity nester, and because of the types of trees that you will find at Temple Lions Park, there are many cavity nesters that can be found. Oh, by the way, this year, a big owl, the barred owl, nested there at Lions Park. Amazing bird to go see. I was asked, and I mentioned it, when you get tearful, about the effects of the freeze in February. This is one of our flycatchers that is here year-round, plus more that come down during the winter. Oh, Joe, <laughs> that we have lost here. And I'm asking a question. I hope anybody who can answer it will respond on this medium. Have any of you seen the Eastern Phoebe since the freeze? We're at Linda.
on the porch. Good. I you have no idea. It is one of the places where you can find them nesting. And they've just been tough to see since the freeze. I'm delighted to hear their house is up in Lorena. Yeah, that's still in that freeze zone though, but yes. the question that I would then have what is the north what is the direction of the nest where it is located in the porch versus north wind? Is it exposed to the north wind or not? Or it's on the to... it's on the west part of the house. Aha. Uh -huh. And that has a little bit better chance in terms of exposure, especially for that particular freeze. But you notice how there's a Darth of silence on how many of you are there? About 50 of you? It should be many more. Yes, they do have multiple broods in a year. And I can hope again, as I indicated for some of the other freeze affected species that the ones we still have active here will have successful broods and that wintering birds will again, there is a vacancy, let's stay and breed once that season rolls around. But this is one of those birds that has really declined, obviously not vanished, but declined because of the disastrous freeze. Red-eyed vireo, only around Oh, I'm lying again, but mostly seen around riparian areas where you have willows. This is one that earns its name very obviously. Look at that eye. Very red eye. Very loud song that it has. And if we're there in May and I take you to the place where we conclude our field trip, usually on the outside of Blora, we should see at a minimum here this beautiful bird. What can I say? The bird. Painted bunny. If you can tell me of a more spec, thank you. It is the most spectacular, most colorful bird that we have. And I always laughed when I was working on Fort Hood. Every year, starting in April, I get the phone calls. We have an escaped bird in our backyard. I go, well, thank you very much for calling. Let me guess. It has a blue head, a red belly, and a yellow-green back. Yes, how did you know that? <laughs> and you can't blame people for saying that. These birds are gorgeous. Now, why don't we know more about them? When I first started my work on Fort Hood, my first year in 91, I saw four painted bunnings during the breeding season. Nowadays, if I take a group such as yours, it is not surprising to see 70 or more. What happened? They were susceptible to cowbird brood parasitism. And as a result, they were not having successful broods. Once we tackled that issue on the installation and some civilians, again, with proper permit, then the numbers have increased. Like I said, Fort Hood went from 85 pair of black cap vireo to over 8,000. So nowadays when people are fortunate to see this beautiful bird in their backyard on a feeder, there's a reason. Yes, they are netted down south, <laughs> Mexico and farther south, as caged birds. But those numbers are, I hate to say, a statistical pimple versus the overall numbers and what the effect was here. You notice that they've increased greatly here, and yet the activities down there, probably not much change. And with that, I am open to questions. 
All right, Gail. Um, again, lots of discussions in the sidelines. You're pretty good at keeping up with those anyway, but uh, no specific questions that I was able to catch anyway. So if anybody's um, thought of a question or have a comment for Gil, uh, we have him captive right now. And so I just have one. Uh, unmute. Go ahead. Gil, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, uh, I have had, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Washington State right now in Yelm, but I've had a pair of Baltimore Orioles in the yard for, for almost four weeks and they never left. I've never had them stay before. And, uh, and then oh, they I'm left to give you the answer. You've been begging to hear. <laughs> this is the fourth year that Baltimore Orioles have begun nesting near you. Wow. Yes, in the very southern part of your county, almost in Bell County. And it's another case where if you consult any breeding range map, you'll never see the range of the Baltimore Oriole extending into our area. But well, yes, they, Ron, you well, have seen correctly and you yeah. have a nest. Yeah, and I've been looking. I watch which way they fly because they've been eating eating the heck out of oranges. But I, I, I watch which way. That is absolutely yeah. one of their trademarks. I watch which way they fly down the road, and I cannot find the nest. But uh, then they disappeared when I was leaving, and I read that they may disappear for three to four weeks until the babies uh, fledge, and then you might get lucky, and they might bring them back to your yard. Once the young fledge, they lead them to where there's the most food. And at that point, the food means insects. And that means a riparian area. Yeah. And, and there's species there's, that move into willows is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, I, I put I have a lot of decaying fruit with all kinds of insects and the, the, they have been catching insects there in the yard. Absolutely. Now I saw somebody had posted a note. I couldn't read it quick enough. If you could unmute yourself and ask me that question, I couldn't quite read it quick enough. Uh, the yeah, I think maybe Sarah McCormick had a question. Yeah, I'm I'm here. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yes. I just when the picture of the kill deer was up during your presentation, you mentioned that the bird was doing the broken wing trick or display. And I just I hadn't heard of that before and I didn't know what purpose it would serve. Um, unless you were joking, of course, but it did look like no, it. there's no joke. It is a broken wing display because they pretend to have a broken wing, which means all they can hop, they cannot fly and they will flap that wing exactly as if it were broken. That means any predator will go, oh, this is easy chow time. And they will hone in on that adult. But the adult will just hop fast enough to lead a potential predator away from the nest or the young birds. And once it believes it has led them far enough away, magically it can fly. That's brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Gil, right now, I'm, I'm, uh, as far as feeders go, I use one of those Yankee spinners because it's funny watching the squirrels do acrobatics uh, with just black sunflower. But what, what would be, I'm, I want to put a second feeder in, uh, and I may use the Yankee spinner again, but what type of feed would you would it be millet or what to attract other birds i would do a combination of fruit and nut that you can buy at sarah i don't want to advertise any company but any of the major retailers that sell and buy by the big bag it's much more cost effective but a combination of nuts and fruit with some of the other things mixed in such as sunflower will provide a very attractive come and get it from many species, including those that may not prefer the black all sunflower, which for overall purposes is the best. Thank you. I have a comment. 
Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Gil, yeah, did you, I didn't notice, did you mention red-shouldered hawks during your uh, talk? I did not mention the red shoulder. It is one of our natives, obviously. It is a little bit smaller than the red tail. And it is closer to riparian areas than the red tail. They are fledging right about now. Um, they can be seen if you're walking through Belton on the trail that goes along the creek. If you look around and listen, that I can't imitate. Don't don't even try to think that I'm imitating. Listen for them. They will vocalize very clearly. And they are one of our more, well, definitely one of the more common hawks that we have. They're also butea. I, uh, I live in a rural county subdivision with for, uh, forested areas all around. And uh, when we had chickens uh, a few years ago, uh, we had a red, red shoulder that would hunt them. Uh, and I think he got one of the smaller ones. Um, but anyway, here this last winter, I noticed that we had a pair of them moved into the uh, woods next to my house and they, they're nesting. And uh, occasionally I see them hunting in my backyard. What they prefer is frogs, anything related to them, snakes. They will get mice. And yeah, they will get small birds. I'm not going to deny that. But their preference is for amphibians. They really like amphibians. Thank and you. I just saw a note from Joe Dorn about the quail. I just, a week ago, photographed some quail. And I'm talking about the northern bobwhite on Fort Hood. We still have them. Many of you, ladies and gentlemen, recall when there were coveys of them and you would hear everywhere. Now people like to blame and I'm really against mythology as you probably picked up on. It's the fire ants that got them. Well, I'm not going to deny that fire ants have had some influence, but the 77% decline of the northern bobwhite population in Texas is matched by the similar percentage in Kansas and Nebraska, prairie states. But the difference is those states have zero fire ants. So what can be blamed? There are some excellent references out there, but to put it in short, it's a lack of suitable habitat. They need native vegetation. That means native grasses that grows in clumps, not thatched like so-called improved grasses, which are anything but improved for nature. They have to have a mixture of other native plants, the different flowers to provide necessary food. And that means initially insects and then seeds as the young grow. All of their nests are on the ground within tall grass vegetation. And it has to be more than a few acres in size. Now look around in Bell County and tell me how many places look like that. That's the problem. Loss of habitat for many reasons, construction, overgrazing, overbrowsing, but it's habitat 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 and someone just noted about ah and i'm going to combine what zoe just posted about the horned lizard 
and the Bob White. We used to have the horny toad everywhere. I know you did. Guys carried them in their pockets on the little leash to school even. Come on. They were so common. But the same issue as habitat, which means native vegetation of a certain height with spaces. The horned lizard, the horny toad, moves in between such spaces to hunt and to hide. And what does it hunt preferably? The red ant. But what do we do? What do we see on TV, ladies and gentlemen? Buy this insecticide. It will kill the fire ants for the entire season. All you need is one application and your kids can play with bare legs and feet out in beautiful, thick, luscious, thatched yards. Congratulations, you've killed the horny toad. We still have them on Fort Hood, not as many as we did before. Where? In those areas that are least grazed and are most disturbed by occurrences such as fire. That's how we still have them. So, food for thought, ladies and gentlemen. Any other questions? Uh, Gil, one last thing about about cleaning uh, feeders. You know, I've read some things about about disease transfer and whatnot. That every once in a while, you ought to, with a, a mild Clorox solution or something, clean your feeders in between filling them up. Your thoughts? Absolutely, and that goes. Ah, you pushed my button again. <laughs> We had a kajillion, that's a scientific number that you can look up on Google, kajillion, pine siskins here this year because of some conditions up north where they come from. We did note, people remarked on it on various social media forums, that many, many but there were some a subject to various health issues where the eyes would have growths on them. Um, they would become very inert. They wouldn't have any energy levels and many other indicators like this. One was diseases, fungal bacterial, that could be transmitted because of the masses of birds gathering at feeders. There were those that said, oh, stop all feeding. Yeah, yeah. That would do it probably for that location. But during the freeze, for instance, active feeders were key and essential, as many of you found out, because you got run over by pine siskins and other birds such as that during the freeze. So how do you address that? Well, oh yeah, I bet you are delighted in seeing those goldfinches up there. But what you do is clean them. And now let's translate it to this time of the year. And this time of the year, I'm talking about starts on 23 March, usually, and goes into early November. And I'm talking about hummingbird feeders. Please use hummingbird feeders. Please don't use colored birds. A plain sugar water solution of one to four ratio is what you need. But clean them. Clean them. That is key and essential to keep such feeders clean. And again, when you clean them, watch using chemicals. Please be careful about using chemicals. Nature does not use such chemical products. Any other questions? Or don't put them out as Wanda well. said. Yeah, if you can't keep them clean, let the birds feed. And by the way, the other thing is you're a master naturalist and you're keenly aware of it. And I know many of you are into gardening. Aha, I know you are. Is plant some good, friendly plants for many species such as salvias. The flowers are fantastic for hummingbirds. 
And once those flowers produce seeds, you'd be amazed of how many of our seed gatherers, and I'm talking about lesser goldfinches, for example, beautiful native local bird, will get the seeds of the salvia. Fantastic. Gil, I'm going to put myself out there. Uh, I do not at all consider myself a birder. Um, I enjoy birds and I enjoy taking photos of birds, um, but I have to send an email to Randy Pinkston all the time on, I think this is what it is, am I right? Um, but I learned something that I bet a very large number of the people on this webinar already knew, but just in case I get somebody else. So I know about owl pellets. I've been able, I was in a class, we got to dissect owl pellets and that was amazing. And I found one on my front sidewalk, picking up the newspaper, or just off of the sidewalk, and we have a big tree there, not terribly long ago. And so then it was like, oh, oh we have an owl, and we never can see it. So what we do have, and we had all last spring and summer, and they are back, except I think we have two pairs now. And I live um, just in a house in the historic district, but I do have big oak trees. Uh, we have Mississippi kites. And we have been really fascinated with those and have some great pictures. So uh, a couple of days ago, I went to pick up the paper and I'd been walking by this. I don't know. It looked to me like a bagworm, you know, from the old cedar trees in Houston. And anyway, I finally picked it up and it was like an owl pellet, but not really. And so I came in and Googled up and there are a number of raptors that make owl pellets so yeah, to speak pellets, yeah and i just didn't ever hear that and so and it had seeds in it so it was different you know than an owl um but just in case there's one other person on this webinar that didn't know that we'll just bring us all together here so something new for me the mississippi kites we have you all noticed of how many more we have nowadays than again in the early 90s and in Belton, there are several neighborhoods, the old ones with the established trees that have nesting Mississippi. As somebody just wrote a bunch. Amen. <laughs> yes. We had 11. We had 11 in our yard one day. It was really kind of freaky. But we have two pair that are here. So people, we've, when we were out standing in the yard with cameras and binoculars and stuff, so now the people that walk in our neighborhood, when they walk by, they always look up in the tops of our trees. <laughs> so Good. helping educate people. Rising in. <laughs> oh, Juan, someday I'll bring some folks here, depending what I have. I have a few interesting birds here at times. <laughs> Any other questions? Joe Dorn has posted a couple of comments on here. I've seen he has excellent habitat that he has gone through great efforts and resistance to other factors, influences, to keep it as natural as possible. And there have been some bird counts, some birds that have been spotted where his place is one of the really good ones that we have. Doing a good job on that, Joe. All right. Well, that's it for questions, then, Gil. You're amazing as usual. And Thank uh, you very much. And I hope to see you and shake hands the next time out on Fort Hood. Indeed. Before everybody leaves. I would like to just remind all of our trainees uh, that you 